All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Valentine. I was trying to find a picture of an island that's roughly heart shaped. That's the best I could do. So our boat is here. Uh, it's kind of very small. So. OK, anyway, happy Valentine. Uh, my name's Tom. My family is Sonia and Keanu. And we're living and cruising on our 52-foot Warren catamaran, um, sailing around the world, but haven't quite made it around yet. Tom, yes. Like you might have to talk a little bit louder. Okay, I try to talk even louder. I'm giving my very best, and if I can't talk anymore after 10 minutes, uh, yeah, it's gonna work out. I hope. Uh, yeah, we are from Austria. I'm sure you've noticed my accent, so. In case I'm getting incomprehensible, talking too fast, mumbling too fast, please don't hesitate, interrupt me and say, Tom, slow down. All right, um, I would like to start by giving you a short overview of our journey, just so you can see how we develop our anchoring methods, our ways of picking spots. Uh, because at the beginning, we made a lot of mistakes, maybe not a lot, but enough mistakes and I'm sure we also caused some damage to Pearl but for the past couple of years I think uh, our methods have worked out pretty fine and I would like to show them to you. So we got our boat Pakietea here which is Thailand, the Gulf of Thailand on the border to Cambodia and we actually bought her in 2009 but of course couldn't start cruising right away because we still had to earn money, we had to refit her, but we went to sail uh, a couple weeks each year and yeah, got to know the area quite well and found beautiful healthy reefs uh, in nice marine protected areas there. This was actually start of 2010. When we came back in end of 2010, beginning 2011, this same colony here, coral colony, looked like that. So that's dead and overgrown with algae. Same with that one, beautiful healthy table corals. 11 months later, <coughs> dead. This one as well, nice parietes colony, all dead. So that's got nothing to do with anchoring. It came as a big shock to us, 2010, 11, was a big worldwide coral bleaching event. And all our nice coral that we had discovered just a year before were basically dead. So pretty depressing start for our journey. Um, however, just like a year or two later, we saw signs of recovery. There was a little bit of live tissue left on one or the other colony, some small colonies left, and things had started to look a little better again. So this is 2012. In 2013, we spent a, more or less a whole year refitting the boat, getting ready for the big journey. Uh, and in 2014, that was basically our sea trial year. We went to the Andaman Islands. We went around Singapore again. Uh, we sailed a little bit in Malaysia, this area. And especially in the Andaman Sea, this area, there was a lot of recovery. So lots of live colonies again. They're quite young. So those colonies are maybe four or five years old. They just started to grow after this coral bleaching event. But not perfect reefs, but you could see that Within a couple of years, things had started to improve again. And those fast growing corals kind of recolonized the reef. So this gave us a lot more optimism. Thailand, in most places, is not terribly difficult to anchor. You get nice, large, sandy areas. Not as good as here. I have to say, anchoring here is just, in most places, we've been so far super easy. You have huge, sandy areas. You just drop the hood, and that's it. It's not like that in many places. In 2015, we took off from Thailand to cross the Indian Ocean. And we were amazingly positive, surprised, okay, sorry, bad grammar, uh, in Maldives. We found amazing coral reefs, beautiful, healthy coral, large colonies also, which came as a big of, bit of a surprise to us because uh, there had been huge bleaching events uh, already beginning of 90s, 1990s, uh, the big one, uh, 2010 11 but uh, Maldives was not that hard hit in 2010 and the reef had beautifully recovered so yeah we were just really stoked to see those beautiful reefs and we kind of uh, we increased our efforts to try and don't touch coral with our anchor gear 
and you will find this is not very easy. It's kind of easy to find a spot to place your hook, but there's a lot of chain on the bottom. You get shifting winds. It's a pretty big area that gets swept by your chain. And to have this much space on the bottom without any coral in the tropics is not easy. So most places just don't have such nice big coral areas. So we then sailed from Maldives to Chagas. Yeah, in Maldives, at this in Maldives, we mostly tried to use bow and stern anchor. Uh, we tried to use landlines just to keep us in a straight line and to keep us from uh, moving, um, keep the chain from moving across the bottom, not working very well. Because you, every now and then you get a big squall, it's coming from 90 degrees, and then you're sideways to the wind. Uh, it's not the best method to do it, which we pretty soon found out, fortunately without any damage to the boat. Uh, in Maldives, we also tried uh, one method the first time we made ourselves mooring. So we tried to find big boulders, preferably of dead coral, dead coral boulders, put a rope with some chafe protection around and just made a temporary mooring. And in reasonably calm weather, this works very nicely. So we, every now and then we still do this. Uh, we went on to Chagas, which is right in the center of the Indian Ocean. And already when we entered the lagoon of Solomon Atoll, we were shocked because the coral was just shining out. It was bright white, it was bluish, purple, incredibly beautiful, colorful. Only uh, Sonia and me, we are biologists, so we know if a coral is that colorful, it's not healthy. It's expelled the algae in the tissue, it is bleaching, and it's about to die. So in Chagos 2015, uh, this is bleached coral, and we spent four weeks basically seeing beautiful, nice coral dying. Dying and getting overgrown by algae. So what you see here, those corals are still healthy, but starting to bleach. That looks good. But all the white ones, they are bleached. And I just marked some of the colonies, took pictures over the four year period. And this nice table coral here, here's the bleach stage at the beginning. And then it's already dead. There's some algae growing in it. And after four weeks, it was just fluffy, covered in algae and basically dead. So pretty depressing again, but yeah, what can you do? In Chagos was also the first time we saw someone float the chain, put floats on the chain. They used fenders, uh, sometimes two together, sometimes really big fenders to keep the chain on the surface. And for us, it was like, that's weird. How should this work? Because you really get a bad angle on the anchor. You don't want this. You want as much weight at the bottom as possible. If you have this really steep angle, anchor's not gonna hold. But anyway, this was the way some people did it there to keep their chain from getting wrapped around coral heads. Uh, we thought about it and we're not totally convinced that this can ever be a good method. Anyway, from Chagos, we moved uh, to Muscarine Islands, so like Mauritius, the Union, sailed north of Madagascar, sailed uh, to South Africa. And in 2016, we crossed the Atlantic Ocean. So only stopped in Ascension Island, beautiful volcanic islands, uh, huge purple, uh, purple turtle population. They came there to breed. That's why we went there. We wanted to watch them lay their eggs. Um, and then we moved on to Trinidad and to Panama. By the way, in Ascension, there was one anchoring incident which could have been avoided with the method, with the method I'm going to introduce a little later. Uh, my parents' boat was also there. They had a fountain for show catamaran. It's a deep anchorage. It was a pretty high swell of, I would say, six to eight feet, maybe. Uh, very long swell. It was not rolly, but the boats were just going up and down, very slowly up and down. They had all the chain out, or most of the chain. Depth was about 50 feet or so. And the chain snagged underneath a rock, and their boat, they got short scoped. And then the next wave tried to lift the boat, their bridle broke, and then all the chain got pulled out and it was just connected to the boat by the last piece of rope. That's how they found it when we came back from a hike. I'm like, oh my God, so glad the boat hasn't drifted off. But what my dad did then was he started pulling in chain, it got snagged again, and it ripped the whole windlass just out of the deck. So all the bolts were just whoop. So pretty uncomfortable situation. There was not a lot of wind at that time, 
but fortunately he didn't try to put his fingers anywhere near the chain. You could easily lose fingers in this situation. And there's ways to avoid this. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about it later. So, uh, end of 2016, we crossed the Panama Canal. And ever since 2017, we've been in the Pacific, which so far is kind of our favorite ocean. We are always going around in circles, so we never quite make it around the whole world. Eventually we might, but we still like it here. So we crossed over to by Galapagos to Easter Island in 2017. Uh, also, pretty tricky place to anchor on Easter Island. It's quite deep. Uh, it's no really protected anchor ridges all around. You just have to pick uh, the anchor ridge that's best suited for the type of weather you're expecting. So usually you go to Hangaroa first. This is here, which is yeah quite deep. And the port captain will tell you where to anchor. He advised us to take a spot, and it was we would have destroyed a lot of coral there. So we cheated a little bit. We moved to a little different place, and managed to anchor all right. But still, we didn't have the uh, method quite right then, and I'm sure we destroyed some of the beautiful coral, totally unintentionally, and we couldn't have anchored anywhere else because we were told to go to this spot. But yeah, you live and learn. That's a good time to think about scouting out anchorages, to find a method to scout, to find the perfect spot. And if you look at the Navionics chart, this is the northern part of Easter Island. So I'm here. And yeah, you look at the anchor symbols and Navionics, and then you can compare with a satellite image. I hope you can see it. I think it's quite bright, so the picture isn't very good. But you can see nice sandy spots here, also here. Maybe I use the mouse. This area here, it doesn't really align very well with the Navionics anchor symbols. But if you look at this picture, especially in a, on a high brightness uh, tablet or inside on your computer screen, you're going to be able to find a really nice big sandy area that you have all the space in the world to drop the anchor. So that's how we always plan ahead. When we go to a new place, we don't know exactly where we want to go. We look at the satellite images, uh, put some waypoints, some optional uh, anchor ridges, some op to have some options when we get there. And this works out really nicely. So then we moved on towards to the south of Tuomotus, Gambier, that's the area here. And I want to use this archipelago, Gambier, as an example uh, to show you different situations and how you anchor there. It's a very small place, so from here to here is maybe something like 10 miles, but it's got very uh, different conditions. Uh, all types of anchoring you will probably encounter in all over French Polynesia, maybe all the South Pacific. So within a very uh, narrow radius, uh, limited area, I can use this as an example to show you how we learned to anchor. When we arrived there, uh, we were greeted by other Austrians. Uh, the boat is called Pitufa, and the first thing they did was hand us some of those pearl floats and say, you know, you know how to anchor properly here. If not, uh, we'd like to show you. And we're like, yeah, what do you mean? We're like, yes, so if you want to float your chain, you need to use rigid buoys, not fenders that can compress, because of course, uh, you need to be able, the floats need to be able to go underwater and come back up again. So if you use fenders, they get pulled down, they will be compressed, then they will stay down. But uh, if the wind gets less, you want them to come up again and be at the surface again. So the only way it really works is with rigid floats. Actually, I've brought you some here, some examples. I can show you later or hand them around. That's one of those pearl floats. Uh, you find them everywhere in French Polynesia on the outer reefs. They use the cheapest possible ropes to tie them onto the pearl farms, those polypropylene ropes. They always rip in storms, and that's why you find those buoys everywhere. Uh, they might be in short supply because so many people are using them now, but if you can't find any, uh, everywhere that has pearl farms, they're also for sale there, cost a couple dollars, they're not expensive. Uh, they're really handy. Alternatively, we are now mostly using those thingies here. They were applied to uh, join to a fish aggregating device, also not compressible, kind of hard foam, 
might even be possible to find something like that here. So two of them connected together has a little less buoyancy than the pearl floats, but nearly the same. So and now we just use, there's a carabine here. On the other one, we have a snap shackle. You want to be able to quickly attach it to the chain. Yeah, I'm going to hand it around afterwards. Uh, we have a 10 millimeter, which is like three, eight inch chain. And I'm going to talk about the distance between the floats. So, so let's start here. Okay, that's our tracks. Can we just to show you? Uh, we're trying to color in the lagoon. We have been there quite often and always sail all across. So I just put them away so it's easier to see the ch actual chart. First example will be in this corner. Island is called Kowaku. Um, Kowaku on the southeast is a beautiful place, but you can't go there very often. It's open. Hang on, I go back to the chart again. It's open to the swell and not very, very protected. So you need stable conditions, preferably stable winds out of the east and southeast. Then you can go there. I will start off with some basics. So if that's the usual situation in shallow water, say we use one to five scope, a nice big sandy area. What you find here is that you don't have a lot of elasticity in the whole anchor system. Because it's so shallow, there's not a lot of chain suspended in the water. And what you re really want is a lot of el elasticity in the whole system. I call it the catenary effect. So catenary is the chain curve. Because what actually starts your boat dragging, what causes the boat to drag, is usually not the constant pull. It's those shock loads you get in a gust or if your boat, if you have a monohull, it yaws. On our boat, we accelerate backwards. We have a canoe stern. Our boat really likes to sail backwards as good as forwards. So we accelerate and just pull very hard on the anchor. And that's the time when we would start to drag. So what you want is a lot of elasticity, a lot of catenary effect. And especially in shallow water, that's very limited because there's not a lot of chain to lift. But the second thing that determines if your anchor will hold is the scope itself, which determines the angle. So if the angle is quite shallow uh, and the chain pulls as parallel to the bottom as possible, your anchor will hold better. You all know this. So you say you want more catenary effect, let's try and put a little more chain, go for one to seven. But actually, especially in shallow water, doesn't change much. There's still not a lot of weight of chain in the open water. In case you're wondering, those arbitrary numbers here, the feet, I originally made those uh, pictures in meters because we're, you know, European metric persons, and then I translated them to feet because I think it's just easier to imagine. Anyway, what happens if you put floats on the chain? And that's really interesting because it's kind of counterintuitive. Our instinct was, you put flows on the chain, you get a steeper angle, uh, the anchor won't hold as well. And what we found is, we, because we wanted to protect coral, we put floats anyway, and we found we actually held better. And we were like, okay, that's just our experience, anchor is holding fine, I don't really know why. We thought, okay, maybe it is because of added, added elasticity, added catenary effect. Because if you think, there's a lot of catenary a lot of chains suspended in the water. So in order to pull the chain straight and pull those buoys underwater, you need a lot of energy, which will slow the boat down, really uh, kind of disperse the whole force that's end up at the anchor over a longer period of time. And you really dampen this effect of this jerky movement on the chain. And I just recently found something uh, I was really happy to find. You don't have, have to take my word for it. I found a website of a mathematician. Uh, it's, a, it's called the Catenary or How a Mathematician's an Mathematician Anchors. And he's actually made formulas for this. He's calculating. So if you really want to geek out and want to spend a whole day reading his website, I'm going to give you the link at the end. It's amazing. So this guy is yeah, total nerd. Very nice. I love it. Uh, anyway, this was our experience as well. So this thing, especially in shallow water, where you have only a little chain suspended in the water without buoys, your anchor will actually hold better with buoys. 
also because if you have say 30 of 35 40 knots of wind your chain will be straight anyway so you don't have any residual curve or tiny little bit maybe but uh, whoever dare to go in the water and look at the chain at 30 knots of wind will find that it's basically straight so you don't get a parallel pull on the chain any, uh, on the anchor anymore anyway uh, it's going to be more or less straight and it's going to be at this angle this is why you need a good anchor and a decently sized anchor otherwise you're always going to be dragging so let's go back to this place in Kowaku I've been talking about so in the southeast corner and let's try and find a good spot to drop the hook if you look at the Navionics chart that's what it looks like it's actually not very helpful of course but if you look at a good satellite image the same area looks like this so Navionics satellite image so that's a, why I would highly recommend to familiarize yourself with using satellite aerial imagery on your chart plotter or chart plotting software it helps a lot there's very few places of really accurate charts and for satellite images just give you all the information you would want you learn to interpret the different shades of blue uh, associated with water depth it works nicely so uh, situation we had before shallow water uh, might be somewhere around here this sand is spot here or here so we just add some coral and what you would see with floats attached to the chain the whole chain will just be suspended above the coral uh, that's what you want you don't want them to be in the coral and in a gust still over it one thing important information you have to choose the distance between the buoys thinking about what happens if there is a dead calm so the chain would just ho uh, hang down here and the distance between the buoys needs to be small enough to keep the buoy above the coral even in a dead calm we found the best thing is usually between um, 16 21 23 feet between the buoys so with 23 feet like you put here the chain is more or less neutral in, in the water it's slightly positive buoyant but not a lot if you would put the buoys further apart the chain will slowly start to sink so, but you have to find this out for yourself, for your type of chain. Uh, with the boys you have, find a good distance, but something between um, 16 to 20, 23 feet, that's about the right distance. So, what happens if you don't use floats? Of course, the whole the chain will be in the coral. So even if you find a strip of sand that's without coral, it's just not good enough. You always get wind shifts. Uh, your chain will wrap around the coral head um, maybe especially in uh, an anchorage like Kowaku the swell will pick up try and lift your boat but it can't because it's chained to the bottom so there's a lot of uh, power on your bow on your anchor gear it can lead to really nasty situations and we've seen this a lot of times that people get in total stressful situations because they are just they can't get away they are chained to the bottom uh, have to make the best of the situation there is maybe leave the chain and pick it up later just drop the whole thing and come back in easier conditions we've seen that people had to hire divers to free the chain we've seen especially here also uh, yeah people just ripping like mad on the anchor chain you know short scoping trying to lift and bring big coral colonies out with them so not nice and easily avoidable one more thing uh, the chain moving across the coral you know the galvanization uh, is not very thick on the chain it's just a couple micrometers so if you do this a couple times on rocks on coral uh, this uh, uh, layer of zinc will get thinner and thinner and the chain starts to rust so especially in warm tropical water uh, after only a year year and a half the chain will start to rust and there's just no place to regalvanize in the south pacific so uh, yeah yep Uh, I think it depends very much on what type of chain you get. We met one boat that had some kind of uh, steel they used for surgery. Extremely expensive, but it will last forever. My parents had a, a stainless steel chain, and after one strong gust, the links opened up. The welding wasn't good enough. They pulled up anchor, and yeah, the, well, yeah, the links were kind of like half of them were broken. Cheap Chinese chain. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't have to happen. But anyway, you, I'm sure you can use a st uh, normal stainless steel chain for a year or so, maybe two. But then you get crevice corrosion and chain still looks good, but will just get brittle and break at some point. So I would not like to have a stainless steel chain. It's got a lot of advantages. It's running better over your chips, your windlass, but it's just treasurous. If you replace a stainless steel chain every two or three years, I'm sure you're going to be fine if you have the money. So I think galvanized chain is still better. And if you take good care of it, try to stay in sandy bottom uh, and re-galvanize whenever it's possible, it's cheaper and it's better. You know what you got. Yep. Yeah, just something to add real quick. Understand that stainless steel and when you go to really stronger or higher quantities of chromium in the stainless, they get softer. So like with a surgical stainless, <clears throat> it's actually a softer steel than it is mild steel that has been put in with galvanization. And the other problem is through stress with a smaller amount, a smaller amount of chromium too, stress on that chain, all that kind of stuff, when it starts to bite and twist and load, you start to burn the chromium, it's going to go mild too, sooner or later it's going to rust as well. So, yeah, yeah. stay with what you know, right? Yeah, plus you don't really see the rust, it's just a tiny little bit, and you still think, ah, that's good enough, until it breaks. Yep. So, I would not go for stainless myself. <clears throat> All right, anyway, this chainy crawl, that's not what we want. Um, if you look at those pictures closely, you might have noticed that I put the anchor pretty close to this coral colony here. So what if the wind shifts and turns you on the other side, you will still end up putting a chain around this colony here. That's true. Uh, there's several ways you need to, uh, or you can avoid this. The big question is, how much chain would you like to have between your anchor and the first float here? Depending on conditions, it can be done with just twice the water depth. So if you have good holding ground, big anchor, good anchor, uh, twice the water depth might be enough between the anchor and your first float. We prefer three times water depth because we have a high windage, it's catamaran, high windage, and we accelerate so fast backwards. But this means you need a larger sand patch. Usually you don't find sand patches that are large enough, so we usually try and make the most out of what we find and put the anchor right next to uh, the windward coral patch we find. Of course, that's a problem with shifting winds. So what I quite often do, because I like to play around with those things, attach a second anchor like this onto the chain, shackle it onto here, which means the turning point is in the center of the coral patch. And if we move to the other side, still gonna be fine. But if you have a smaller monio hull or you have a massively oversized anchor, low windage boat, it's usually fine to put the anchor right in the center of the coral patch and just use two times water depth as distance between the anchor and the float, but that's just something you have to play around with just to familiarize yourself and find the best method for you. Uh, that's our favorite method to anchor, and that's a situation you find really often uh, in French Polynesia. Very often on the windward side of the atolls or on the wind, windward coral reef, there's a shelving sand area. So the water depth here would be something between, I'd say six and nine feet above here. And then it's going down deeper. And this is maybe something like 16, 20 feet. So if you put the anchor on top of this shelf, it's usually those shelves are quite clear. You don't have a lot of coral up there because it's a highly mobile substrate. It's really good holding sand. Uh, and then you float your chain and you just drift out into deeper water. This means you get an excellent pull angle on your chain and uh, the anchor will hold really well. It's like this, for example, in this area here. It's another beautiful little island called Tauna. Again, that's an avionics chart. Doesn't tell you a lot. It looks detailed, but it's not because that's what it actually looks like. 
and you can see this sandy shelf area everywhere around here. It looks terribly shallow, but that's only because the water is so nice and clear. Especially this bit in here is probably, um, I would say, 16 feet. So enough for most boats. We like to anchor this area here. It's still around 16 feet, so deep enough. That's actually our boat here. So what I did, this is one of the normal satellite images anyone can get. This is a drone picture of mine, a geo referenced. Looks about the same, but you can get the dimensions, uh, the scale. Our boat is about 52 feet. We're anchored here in a nice shallow. Uh, but if you have a deeper draft vessel, we are lucky because we only have about three feet draft. But if you have double or three times that, also no problem. You just put the anchor here and float out into deep water and all is fine. This means you can only go to those places if the wind will stay in the right direction. Otherwise, you might turn onto the shelf. Uh, in some places, not a problem. In this particular place, if you have more draft, might be a problem. However, I would only recommend going to those places in settled conditions. Uh, weather forecasts are good, so it should not be too much of a problem. And especially the season when most people sail through to a motus area, it's the southern winter there. It's June, July, something like this, maybe a little earlier. You very often have stable conditions with southeast winds all the time. So that's what the reef looks like. We hopped in and, and checked out those corals there. <laughs> Because it's interesting, uh, you know, you can't really tell if it's alive or dead in what condition the reef is. It's actually in a really good condition. It has recovered very nicely from the last bleaching events. Uh, but if you anchor in the deeper part, where you might be more comfortable, you end up doing this. So, not very nice to see. I have to say that uh, it's by far not the worst we've seen. It's actually not such bad anchoring, although it doesn't look nice. It's also not good anchoring, but there's way worse. Uh, the chain is floated. It's a decent sized, really good anchor. It's actually a massive anchor. And the anchor is on sand. The only thing that's wrong is the sand patch was too small. So the, the people just choose, chose a too small sand patch. But you can easily avoid this if you look at the satellite picture again. This is right here this area you see sandy patches but you can tell right away if you look at it it's just not going to be large enough so don't count of anchoring there just you know mostly people look at the satellite image or like i'm not feeling comfortable anchoring this close to shore this might be too shallow for me you know let's just go there and see we'll find a spot but if the satellite image is good and you can see everything that is there it's not going to change magically just because you go there if you don't feel comfortable anchoring on nice clean sand uh, and you want to anchor in deeper water, I would say please don't go there, go to a different place. There are some good deeper places, good sand down here, you can see it in this picture, only it's a little further away from this nice island. So you have to compromise. Maybe you're half a mile away from the island, you don't destroy coral, you're anchoring in a safe way, but you have half a mile thinking right. So just it's all about priorities and what you want to do. Okay, so going back to this way, you see uh, it's the same thing we had before in shallow water and with the floats, only the boat is in nice deep water and everything just floats nicely on top of the coral. So what happens in a little deeper water? You can see here I uh, used the same coral colonies as before. Uh, you would like a larger sand patch in deeper water because you would want more chain between the anchor and the first buoy here. What you also will realize, with deeper water, your first buoys will start to get pulled underwater. It doesn't matter at all, it will just balance out. So it will be pulled underwater until, it, until the weight of the chain balances the buoyancy of the first float. So it won't, be pulled, uh, it won't get pulled down all the way to the bottom, just about as far as until the buoy can carry the weight of the chain. So it doesn't matter. Only thing you need is a larger sand patch or set the anchor really carefully better and be content with two times water depth between the anchor and the first float. So that might be the case, say if you anchor here, here is deeper water, 
large, large big sand patch. I've measured this from here to here. It's probably something around uh, 150 feet sandy area. So that's pretty large. Uh, you can measure this on your chart plotting software or in your chart plotter and know beforehand, okay, that's the area of sand I will be able to anchor. It's always good to have certain options because another boat might be there already before you get there. So with the right timing, going the right time of day, not arriving late in the evening where you can't see anything anymore, usually works out fine and you can pick a really nice spot. So, what happens in really deep water? That's an interesting thing because before we never used floats in really deep water. We also don't want to do it in really strong winds because, yeah, we, we have, uh, hang on, 70 meters. That's in feet like 230 feet. That's about the chain we have on the boat. It's a lot, but it's not a terrible lot. So if we anchor in 60 feet of waters, we just get a scope of about one to three. And we found that without floats, even with floats, we always held up until 30, 35 knots easy. And we've never been in stronger conditions so far in really deep water. Because uh, if we anchor in deep water, uh, actually we've been in stronger conditions, but only without floats. So I cannot warrant for uh, anchoring with floats in a really strong storm in deep water. But in deep water, generally, you don't need such a big scope. You don't need one to seven or even one to five. In deep water, you have so much chain out, there's so much weight. Uh, usually one to three is fine if the bottom is good. So that's our experience so far. Maybe it's just because we got a really good anchor, but it's always worked for us. Uh, but all the boys will be submerged. What we do is uh, we add the first buoy about the same distance that we would use in less water depth. And then we just keep on adding, uh, but not all the way to the boat. Because the last bit is just going to be held up by the boat anyway. So all the buoys can be underwater. It just needs a little bit of uh, trying, try and error to find out how many boys are actually needed to keep the chain that you want to have in the water actually suspended in, in, the, in the water column. But yeah, if you try around, the good thing is in Polynesia, the water is so clear, you will always be able to see what you're doing. But that's also one of the reasons why we like, we prefer to anchor in shallower water where you can also see the bottom really well. Usually you see the bottom really well up until, uh, I always have to calculate 50 meters. So uh, say 45, 50 feet, you usually see the bottom. But if it's getting deeper, uh, it's getting really tricky. So yeah, what happens here, my pictures, the frame gets too small. But the, I, th I think the reason why the anchor will still hold with a one to three scope is because you get a huge catenary effect, amazing amount of elasticity in the system. Okay, and if the weather is unsettled and you don't feel comfortable anchoring in tricky areas with lots of coral, uh, you might get shifting winds, then you just go to a safe place. And in Gambia, for example, this would be Rikitea, the main village, or here Tarawai South, uh, this area, you get large mud areas, maybe 30 to 50 feet deep, really good holding if you dig in your anchor and then you're good to go for uh, unsettled weather and even stronger storms. So watching the weather is a really, really important thing. So that's the main uh, village anchorage in here. Decently large area. We've seen as much as 25, I think even 30 boats in here gets quite, get, gets quite crowded. That's what it looks like uh, with a satellite overlay. Channel is well marked. And here you got all the space to anchor even in gusty conditions. So that's where we usually go if it's unsettled. All right, let's sail up towards two motus. Get in our personal paradise. Which I think if you count the time together, how much time have you spent in two motus? I think at least a year altogether. It's if you like the world underwater, you like to dive, snorkel, two motus is the place to go. So one atoll, for example, Tahanea, beautiful place. Fakarava is something like the local diving yachting hub. So there's decent infrastructure, good provisioning. Tanea is uninhabited, very nice place to be, easy to get into, nice passes. That's what it looks like on the satellite image. That's one of the main anchorages next to this pass here. So that's what it looks like. 
pretty popular anchorage uh, at this time of year. Uh, actually, it was also during COVID, so not too many boats. Sometimes uh, there's also 20, 30 boats with counts as crowded for two motors, maybe not for here. Um, sometimes you get nice and calm conditions, but you can tell from those pictures that the anchoring is quite tricky. So it's just full of coral. And you might think it's rocks under the water. No way to tell. Even if you go into an anchorage, you could still convince yourself, oh, it's all dead anyway. And that's what many people will probably tell you, uh, that a lot of the coral is dead anyway. It's not quite true. It was more like this maybe four years ago, so after the last massive bleaching in 2015-16, now a lot of the lagoons are recovering. So at the moment, it's a really good time to go there and enjoy the coral. I would say until the next El Nino, uh, yeah, I'm scared what the next El Nino will bring, but we'll see. If you go underwater, it looks like that. So beautiful coral, super nice reef. Uh, that's why all those things that look like rocks actually look like underwater and you really do not want to destroy that with your anchor chain. So it's fantastic snorkeling. It's just beautiful. Clear water. That's why we all want to go there. And yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's also easy to convince yourself that we sailors are only a tiny, tiny part of the problem, right? Uh, most problem is the coral bleaching. It's the warmer ocean. Uh, coral dying off on a massive scale because it's just too warm. However, the places we go to, we don't want to destroy, right? It's always certain conditions we like. We like sheltered places. Uh, and because there's so many boats there now, all of the sheltered places will be full of boats. And if we all anchor in a careless fashion, we're just going to wipe out the coral there, just convert it to rubble. And we've seen this in many places. And yeah, just would be a shame. And it's easy to avoid if you put in a li little extra effort. So when you approach an anchorage, always good to keep a good lookout, look where you're going, and then drop your hook on a nice sandy spot like here. And you can see it's super tricky. All those little coral uh, patch reefs are very close together. But yeah, anchor is here. Here's our float. And we have an easily 180 degrees swing radius, no problem. And with shifting winds, we would just put out a second anchor and be able to move all around. This looks extremely shallow. It is shallow, but the top of those patch reefs is maybe something like seven, eight feet underwater. So deep enough for us. Yep. Our uh, second anchor is, is a, a, a fortress, so 10 foot style. Quite easy to handle, but a super holding power. So I like to play around with that one. It's a rock now. Rock, uh, yeah. 40 kilogram, which is, yeah. Just wondering, I know it depends on the conditions, but how many boats do you carry on board? Uh, we usually uh, use three, three boys. Sometimes we, knew we need four. In rare occurrence, it's five, so we carry five floats. That's one more thing I will I shortly want to mention. It's because um, you would think that sailing to the South Pacific, it's in the middle of the trade wind belt, so you would always expect easterly, southeasterly winds. And that's not the case. This is uh, on OpenCPN, the climate climatology overlay. And what you see here is the main tropical convergence zone, so the place we all have to get through to get to the South Pacific. And this here is actually the, what you see here, the purple parts are precipitation likelihood, the precipitation statistics. And this here is the South Pacific convergence zone. And this basically means every now and then, a low pressure system will develop here, this area, and will, will cause unstable conditions and shifting winds. And I'm telling you this because usually, actually that's a grip file from about a week ago. That's the type of conditions we would like to have. It's very gentle, easterly winds, beautiful weather, hardly any rain at all. But very often you get something like that uh, with low pressure systems that send out troughs going diagonally across the area. So just to see where we are. This is uh, Tahiti here, and these are two motors here. And you get troughs of, hang on, I think I might be lying. This is Fiji already, sorry. That's Fiji here, and actually Tahiti. 
Yeah, it's right here where the cursor is. So that's the Hedi, that's the two motors. Okay. Anyway, what you need to be aware of is if the grip files or most of the models tell you you get light westerly winds, don't believe it. That's because uh, with the shifting winds, and if the wind is in the north, the shift is protected, uh, uh, sorry, um, projected uh, to go only to the north, it's usually still fine weather. You all also need to get the precipitation, the rain probability. If it is decently low and northerly winds, you're probably gonna be fine. But always when the wind shifts to the northwest or to the west and the rain probability goes up, it means you will get squalls up to maybe 30 knots, maybe even more. Even if the forecast wind tells you it's gonna be like 10 or 12 knots, westerly wind, higher rain probability will mean squalls nearly always, and you need to account for this when you plan to pick a spot to anchor. Especially in two motors, that's an incredibly tricky situation because the atolls are large. Usually you would anchor on the east side of the atoll to be protected from the easterly winds. And if you get the wind shift all the way, clocking all around and turning all the way to the west, usually you get stronger squalls. Uh, but if you keep this in your mind and you know where you are, you might pick a smaller atoll with less fetch. You might try and hide behind a reef. There's various ways uh, to do things, but you need to be aware that the normal forecast models, you nearly always underestimate the wind in Westerlies. That's just what I wanted to tell you because people quite frequently run into trouble. So boats have been lost in Fakaraba with like 40, 50 uh, knots squalls going through from the west when the forecast said it's gonna be something like 20. So westerly winds, expect more wind. Okay, so what you might want to do before this happens, you might have to cross, cross a lagoon. It's just a little discourse from anchoring, but just because it's, uh, it will happen frequently that you need to cross lagoons. And then you also want to use uh, satellite images to plan your route. You need good light conditions, you need a good, a good lookout, but you also, it helps a lot to plan your route and just draw a line on your chart plotting software, whatever, to avoid all those bombies. From here to here is probably something like three miles, so they are sometimes pretty close together. That's what Navionics will show you, and that's what it actually is like. Somehow close, but uh, not close enough that you can actually rely on it. But if you cross the lagoon like this, you will encounter those bombies. Look beautiful from the air, also if you go and snorkel there, but you don't want to end up on one. We tried this, it's not a, not, not a good thing, not a good thing. <laughs> okay, on the other side of the lagoon, sometimes it's like that, beautiful places, and you can see that's our boat again, right on top of one of those sandy shelves, Perfect place to anchor. There's a lot of space, it's perfectly holding, and no coral. Anchoring here is a lot trickier. It's possible if you find a good spot, but a lot harder. Also like here, the shelf area here is maybe, I would say 15 feet, something like that. Uh, deep enough for most boats, but this place here, people usually go and settle southeasterly conditions. If it's blowing hard off the south southeast, this is the southeast corner of Tahanea, perfect place to go, because it will always flow from here to here, and you can swing out into the deeper water, all good. So, as you see here, we had northerlies, uh, nice weather, light northerlies, also not a problem. So that's what, look, what it looks like, anchoring on one of those shelvy areas. You see our anchor here? I'm sorry it's not dark enough, you can actually see because usually you would see the sand disturbed in this area here. We had wind shifts about, I would say, 100, 120 degrees, but there's enough space. And we get an excellent pull angle from the anchor out to our boat. So this will hold anything, even if you would get 50 knots, which you basically you never do. <coughs> Hopefully never do, but we'll be fine, no problem. So that's what it looks like with the chain suspended in the open water. Okay, so just some carry home points. You need an anchor that will set within a very short distance. So if you have an anchor that you need to gently dig in and pull for 20 feet until it holds, those techniques won't work. You need a good modern anchor design. Uh, there's plenty around, I'm sure. We can vouch for rock now because that's what we have. 
not in any way affiliated to Rocknet, but that's just what we have. Um, I know that the German Bugle anchor is also really good. Uh, we also know that there's an anchor called Jumbo Anchor, holds really well, and there's plenty of others. I'm sure you would have plenty of suggestions. But if you use a plow type anchor, that's what they do, they plow. They will never rip out of the bottom, but they will just won't stop your boat where you want it to stop. So you need an anchor that actually settles and then stays put. Um, yeah. Also, it's good to carry the heaviest anchor possible, just to have this extra safety if, if you encounter really stronger winds. So if you uh, look at the table the manufacturers use, I'm sure you're good up until to 40 knots or something, but every now and then, what do you do if you encounter 60, 65 knots? Every now and then, you might be in an area where you have the wind will funnel or some, some strong squalls. If you really do serious cruising, uh, you want to feel safe even in those conditions. So try and use the heaviest anchor possible. It's always possible to play around with two anchors. We did this a lot at the start. Our anchor was too small and not a good design. I always uh, put out a second anchor in tandem worked okay, but it was a lot of work. The two anchors got entangled in each other during wind shifts. Uh, yeah, it took me about two years to get this trauma of dragging anchors out of my head. And ever since we have the rock knuckle safe. So. Also one point I haven't mentioned so far, apart from this elasticity added by the boys, you also, of course, you need a good bridle or good uh, snubber line that's elastic and to take the pull off your windlass. So I can't forget about this. And what I consider to be really important, make your own decisions. So if you're at a certain place, you, you're cruising with friends, you're in a group of boats, and you start discussing, is it going to be all right weather-wise to go at this place and that place? You discuss for hours, and at the end, everyone's fed up, and everyone just says, like, oh, let's just go. We've had the situations a couple times. Rely on yourself. Uh, all the information you got, everything you've learned, you know your boat best, you know your anchor best, your chain, you know what you can do, and decide for yourself. Because usually, if you discuss too much with other people, uh, it ends up in confusion, and you... We have this quite often that in the end, everyone's making bad, bad, bad decisions. So, you're your captain, your own boat, you know what you're doing. Yeah, just adding this to be sure. You can do what I suggest, but uh, it's your own responsibility. Not my fault if something doesn't work out. <laughs> okay, here's some further reading tips because a lot of people have written about this topic and have found out that floating the chain works really well. And the funny thing is that most had a similar learning curve than we did. So using fenders because no one ever's got uh, rigid floats at the beginning trying to adjust the length of the rope between buoy and chain doesn't work. Everything just tangles up. So I'm just going to hand, hand this around. You want to have a look at it? We use a really, as short as possible, rope between buoy uh, and chain. <coughs> because sometimes, when there's no wind, the boys tend to get entangled, and that's not very nice. And the shorter it is, the less uh, likely it is to happen. So that's actually the main pitfall. Things might get, in, get entangled in a calm, and if you get a squall then, you'll be short scope. So you need to monitor your anchor gear. You can't, can't just stay at one point uh, for days and days and don't check, because usually you have to check every now and then, then you're going to be fine. Uh, that one is a carabine. Uh, the other one is a snap shackle. Uh, I would maybe not use a soft shackle because it's better to be able to do it one-handed. So carabine, I think, is better than our snap shackle. You just go like blop, 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 and it's done. So if they're easier, the better. I just didn't have the enough carabines. I'm going to get one. Yeah, I put it right into the link, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, usually not me, usually it's Sonja. <laughs> okay, this here is the article about... Uh, how a mathem mathematician anchors. If you have a lot of time at your hands and you're really interested, I highly recommend it. But take your time. That's serious stuff. It's in English. It's a German guy, and that's why uh, the domain is German and everything. But he translated the whole thing to English, and yeah, it's pretty cool. 
Okay, so just to sum it up, if you take the time to learn how to anchor with those floats and you find a method that works for you, in the end you will end up saving a lot of time. Anchoring itself might take a little longer, not much, but a little, but you will never run into the situation where it takes you hours to get your anchor back up again and where you need a diver or you need to dive yourself or you get in stressful, dangerous situations. So in the end, you will actually end up saving time, although it seems a little complicated at first. But to be honest, it's not, not a big deal. And especially in those articles, I recommend reading some of them. They go into more detail into the whole process of anchoring. People have different methods. Some put out more chain first, uh, dig the anchor in, and then pull in chain again, and then add the float. That's a possibility. Uh, we never do this. For us, it works differently, but you just find a way how it works for you. And yeah, you will save a lot of stress. You will save your anchor gear because uh, a rusty chain is just super annoying, the whole deck full of rust. And it's much better to not let it chafe. By the way, if you hear this noise your chain is making, I'm sure everyone's heard it. Um, some places it might just be rocks, but in the South Pacific, it's nearly always coral. So you must not deceive yourself. As soon as it goes like you are destroying coral. So. Yep, so the whole thing will also save the reef. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said the length be between the anchor and the first float yep. was the depth of the water. Is that right? I would say uh, at least twice water twice depth. Twice the depth. Yes. Uh, we usually prefer three times water depth, but it depends on the wind that is expected, on the bottom, if it's really good holding. Usually you get away with twice the water depth, just fine. Do you make your time? Um, most of the times in the South Pacific. Uh, even here, if there's boulders, rocks, we use them. On this anchorage, no, that's not necessary. So if it's not necessary at all and it's muddy bottom, no, we don't. Any more questions? Uh, I have, have a piece of chain and the anchor and I put it on a large fender or some other float, hop in the water, dive down and shackle it on. Uh, there's other ways to do it. So our friends from Pitufas just do it straight while they set their anchor from deck. Also works. But yeah, I just prefer, I like this exercise in the water and the free diving. Uh, there's several ways to do it. When you're in the water yourself, uh, it's you can see better what actually happens so even if you do it from above and while you do the anchoring it's always good to hop in the water afterwards maybe reposition the anchor or you just see what you've done and if it works so, so swim it out. actually swim it out dive down and shackle it under the chain that's what i usually do so that's also why we prefer shallow water so i'm not doing it in 30 feet i'm usually doing it yeah, 10 feet of water Okay, yeah, if you want to, uh, I can just shortly how we usually do it. Um, as a catamaran, it's fairly easy because I can keep the bow in the wind with the two engines. Uh, we find a good spot. So as I said, the bow directs me to the perfect place where we want to go. Usually we need, we know before uh, the place where we want to put it. So GPS accuracy and for satellite images, key referencing. It's good enough usually to be able to put the anchor within a couple meters, so it works well. Uh, so stop, I stop the boat. Works between, for us, no wind and say 15 knots. If it's more, we are in a bit of trouble because our engines are really weak. Uh, but I try to be stationary. We drop the anchor, see if the spot is good. And then we just slowly go back, paying out chain until about three times water depth. So it attaches the first float, Give it another 15 uh, or 20 feet between. Next one, another one. Uh, then we attach the bridle, more chain. And in the end, I just pull on hard and dig the anchor in. Usually I pull a little bit first to just align the whole thing. And then I pull really hard to make sure it's holding uh, and the anchor is well dug in. 
So that's how, how we do it, and it usually works well. I swear a lot. <laughs> yeah, our main problem at the moment is uh, the bridle is really long. It will be underwater, and our bridle will catch the buoy, or all of buoys sometimes. So the next thing we're going to get a thick floating line to keep our bridle on top, because then uh, if there's calm and everything gets entangled, once we pull on it, uh, the bridle will slip over the buoys. I think should be better. Uh, Maybe one of you can come up with a way to attach a buoy uh, so one can slip above the other. We haven't found a way since. So sometimes, if the walls are that calm, I need to go in the water and entangle things. Disentangle things, sorry. So that's the main uh, drawback of the whole method. However, in the South Pacific, you hardly ever get periods without any wind. So usually, if there is some wind. Here, calms are a lot more frequent especially during night with the whole thermal stuff going on. First no wind, little bit this direction, no wind, little bit that direction. You will basically never have this in the South Pacific or very rarely. So, yeah. Right? Yeah, only, so, I can say, you have That's only because I was too lazy to draw it again. On the shelf, you can actually get away with a lot less chain. So, because you just need the uh, chain, you need to think about the shallow water and where the boat is, and the scope of one to seven or so would be fine. You don't need one to nine. Yeah. So, what what we use is uh, OpenCPN with MB tiles. So we've off, right from the start, we've basically only used OpenCPN, so I'm familiar with it. Yeah. And you can do so many things with it. So I'm sure there's other ways, but that's how we do it. Uh, on ChartLocker, if you have looked, or just Google for ChartLocker, there's gigabytes upon gigabytes of excellent satellite imagery for free. Sorry? With OpenCPN? Yeah. The, uh, the, the file format is called uh, MB Tiles. Oh, yeah. And you can download off the ChartLocker. Uh, Navionics charts, uh, Google, Bing, and even ArcGIS satellite charts, the different sources. I haven't used them, I don't know how good they are. Uh, I used the ones from the chart locker. Uh, Bruce Balan on migration made them. It's called chart locker. And I just know the ones that I made myself and the ones he made. I don't know the soggy post ones very well. So. Uh, I think you have to Google for chart locker. It's not, it's, it's uh, sailing vessel migration. And if you just put in chart locker, you're gonna find it. The water depth? Yeah. Quite shallow. Quite shallow. So we, depends on which area. Uh, it's very rare that we need to anchor deeper than 40 feet. Uh, in those thermal scenarios, we usually anchor between, say, 8 and 15 feet. Uh, yeah, Gambier. Fakarava. It, it might, might be 60 feet sometimes, rarely. Fakarava also. Fakarava, uh, especially at the main village, is deeper. It's like 60 feet and difficult anchoring because there's coral boulders that deep down. 60. So this is a place where uh, this deep water floating works well or is necessary. There's also some moorings there, but they are usually all taken. But yeah, it's, it's more common to anchor shallow and it's usually possible and easier because you need smaller sand patches and you see what you're doing. So I think those stories about in the South Pacific, there's only deep anchorages, uh, is not quite true anymore. It's like, if you rely on charts, 
uh, and you don't have satellite images, it might be true because you wouldn't want to go that shallow. But uh, with the satellite images, it's not a big deal. So it's actually easier to try and find a more sh a shallower spot to anchor. Okay. Sorry. Um, I think. Trying to think, it was mostly wrapping chain around coral and not be able to get away in serious conditions. So, yeah, this happened in Fakarava. Uh, yeah, it's just other than that because the bottom is usually really good. So this uh, type of sandy uh, or coral sand or coral mud, if you have a decent anchor, it's really good holding. Uh, but there's so much to snag your chain. That's most of them people get into trouble. Yeah. And it th with those shifting winds, especially with westerly conditions. So. That's without using floats? Sorry? That was without using floats? They would grab that was without, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. It's kind of a boat specific question. Uh, where are we working? can only go about 60 feet of chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so, when we're trying to get that, that cantering effect on weight effects that most people have with the yeah. chain, yeah. would you suggest possibly floating the line? Yeah, the I would. Uh, and then maybe doing a pellet, like an anchor in between them, to get that weight? That's a good question. Uh, how, how heavy is your anchor? Okay. That's pretty good, actually, so, from, from Monsoon, so I think it should work. Um, I think I would just, because uh, 60 feet of chain should be fine in shallower anchorages with a bit of uh, road, and I would try and keep the road out of the coral, so because otherwise it will just sink down and wrap and chafe everywhere. Um, maybe just put, you have to try it out, depends on the depth, but like one float at the end of the chain and just two, three more along the, or maybe small ones along your anchor road, just to keep it. You will not add a lot of elasticity or a lot of catenary effect because the road is so light, but you will avoid snagging the rope itself on coral. And I think you're gonna be fine if you're anchoring carefully and your anchor is well dug in, should, should be okay. I would really try and anchor in as shallow conditions as possible so you really know where the anchor is uh, where the sand is. I'm pretty sure it's gonna work. Uh, the second anchor or the ad additional weight, problem is it gets so fiddly and you end up just wrapping the one thing around the other. Just I think I would try and keep it as simple as possible to avoid stress when there's any change in conditions. So, but you need to try it out. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, I think we Wrap it up. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay.